Hi. Um, who are we? So, I'm a grifter. Um, I have uh, been involved with Black Hat or uh, taking care of the technical operations for Black Hat for all the shows around the world for the last 16 years. I'm Bart, or Stumper, some call me, and I have been around 11 years riding this guy's coattails. So, um, so yeah, so we um, we got involved a long, long ago when um, when honestly the let's see the, this show was 250 people. This show was that's that's about the size for any regional show. It was when we used to be in Amsterdam, which I miss greatly. Nothing against London, but you know, Amsterdam. <laughs> um, so. Uh, the U.S. show at the time was also about 1,000 to 1,200 people. Uh, now the U.S. show is about 20,000. So the network has morphed and changed to adapt uh, to those things. And we're the guys who do that. Um, we don't do it alone, though. So in the early days of Black Hat, um, we used to roll everything our own. Right? So we just bought consumer equipment and we tried to make things work. Uh, the first Black Hat shows that I was involved in, we had like a Cisco 2600 and then some Cisco APs with the external antennas you would tape on the walls. Um, so we, we had that going for us. And then we had to keep scaling things. At one point we were shipping 65 SoCris boxes to whatever show we were going to, running OpenBSD and PF and writing custom scripts for them to call home and tell us they were alive or what was going on on the network. Um, that didn't work after a certain um, amount of time. And so a few years ago, uh, Bart and myself said, man, we really need like enterprise grade gear. Like if this network is just, you know, it's too hard to keep it from tipping over. Maybe we should go down to the expo hall and ask a vendor down there if they would be willing to like give us some gear, right? So that's what we did. We went down to the expo hall and we talked to the first vendor and we were like, so hi, we run the Black Hat Knock and we were wondering if you would be interested in helping us with, and they were like, yes, <laughs> you know? And so we're like, cool, all right, cool. <laughs> this is gonna be fun, right? So then we were like, let's go shopping. And we like wandered the expo hall and talked to the different folks who we wanted to work with and everybody said yes, they wanted to be involved. So it's been great. So they are partners, they're not sponsors. Um, they may be sponsors of the show, but they're not sponsors of the knock. They actually, um, no one can pay to have their equipment be part of the knock. That is a decision we make as a knock team and decide what we're gonna bring in. And that has changed over the years. There are um, vendors where the technology didn't do what we hoped it would do, or it didn't scale to what we needed to scale to. Or in some cases, they just had overexcited marketing teams um, who wanted to say that they ran the knock at Black Hat, and then now they're not involved at all. So um, oh, we can't have nice things. Yeah. So it's like get your marketing teams in check, um, or they will spoil your technical relationships. So we, um, like I said, we we had to scale. These are the folks that we're working with today and have been working with. I think it's this this crew for the last two uh, two and a half years. Um, we get some of their A-list players, their top folks come out and help us out in the knock. So um, we actually do work side by side with their, um, their folks to make everything happen. It's been pretty awesome. That's us. Oh my gosh, we are so good looking. <laughs> um, so that's it, that's the entire knock team for this show. Uh, we took this picture yesterday. Um, Again, filling all of those knock partners as well as some of just the, the core black hat team that comes out and does it. So let's Roar. get into it. <laughs> um, so we told you guys we we're going to talk about architecture. We came to any of our smaller ones as well, and uh, there it is, you guys. That's, you know, that's what holds it together for you. He never does an architect like he like he <laughs> does like these really elaborate, beautiful designs for the U.S. show because Thanks. There's so much stuff. <laughs> Thanks for covering for me. It's uh, it looks <laughs> like you know like you have to have that. And then for the regional shows, he like draws it on a napkin. So I just started putting this in, and just this show, he was like, "All right, I'll start doing it." <laughs> so. To, to that extent, and we'll cover it a bit, I mean, everything's pretty fluid, and there's a lot of things that change, whether we get on site and 
something breaks or doesn't break or it was expected or unexpected when we run a new version one place and not another then then there's certainly issues that we run into so I'd be rewriting that diagram 22 different times and it you know we kind of understand and it's it's fluid more but but obviously the the, the complexities of the the US show with that uh, it gets a lot more in depth but to that point, uh, here's the architecture basically that we have at this show. So um, basically what everybody does, and we showed the partners here, Palo Alto runs our core. We have two PA3250s in an active-passive HA pair. Uh, Cisco provides us with Umbrella, the uh, um, uh, open DNS acquisition, as well as threat grid that will uh, detonate any of the, the malware or anything else that we need to and can interact in those sandboxes with that malware. Uh, to kind of determine that good, bad versus bad, bad, as we'll talk about here in a little bit. Uh, Ruckus provides all of our wireless throughout the venues. Um, this We have 28 APs from them with two uh, controllers running that. Um, RSA brings plenty of gear to uh, basically, uh, they provide all of our forensics. as We run the NetWitness suite. They provide our forensics um, as well as endpoint on the registration machines and a few other things that we'll get into. Um, tons of gear that, that they bring to capture all of the packets that uh, traverse the network while on site. Uh, we'll also dig into that and I'll explain a bit to you on that. And then Gigamon provides our tapping solution to provide those feeds into NetWitness as well as other open source tools that we have uh, and we'll show you some of that. So what is, um, what's cool about this gear, again, is like, you know, all these folks bring it um, and we don't have like a real, it's, it's not like the best looking setup back there, um, hiding behind the dividers. Uh, we have literally put the gear on luggage carts in the past. Um, I think the RSA gear is it's sitting on a pallet, like a wooden pallet on the floor right now. So we're talking about probably when we're all, all said and done, you know, a million plus dollars worth of equipment and, um, and it's sitting on the floor. Or, and there's like or a we little have, oscillating fan that's like that. Oh. <laughs> just blowing on it. Um, <laughs> Trying to keep it cool. But, uh, you know, so we're super <laughs> ghetto. Yeah, and then um, we have things happen like, you know, we plug all this equipment in. Now, we asked for a certain number of amps, you know, from the venue. We we're like, this is what we're going to need. We're going to be running a lot of equipment. But on setup day, pop! <laughs> Uh, we blow the circuit and the, everything. It got real quiet in the knock, right? All the fans turned off, all the beeping stopped. Um, and we were like, whoopsie. Um, so we needed more power. They came and gave us that. So now we're up and running and everything seems great, right? Then the ceiling starts to drip. Uh, this isn't onto the gear. Like, literally water now, was... <laughs> the, if, you, if you stop by the knock, it's a relatively large room, right? The water was dripping directly above the equipment. So you, you don't just, make you, that up. Yeah, you can't plan for these things. You just kind of have to adapt. So uh, we we got a bucket. We got a bucket. <laughs> yeah, like literally, we we moved the equipment over about a foot. Put a bucket and then there. Put a bucket there. <laughs> what would like, you do? Huh? I was like, I didn't pay for this. Um, no, I'm I'm teasing. Somebody, please did. bring your stuff back, guys. I swear. Um, we take good care of it. Um, so you may have seen, if you poked your head in there, uh, we like shiny things. We have a lot of different dashboards and stuff going on. Um, these particular dashboards were set up uh, on screens that you could come into the knock and look at throughout the show. And the, the data was updated in real time uh, to show what was taking place on the network. Um, what you saw in the middle there going pew pew, everybody likes the pew pew, right? Um, what it is, is, here, I'll, let me start it again. Um, the green, I'm going to break it now. There we go. Uh, the green data, this is just the uh, active hosts on the network. So um, these guys are awful chatty, right? So we're taking a look at that. The green is TCP. The red is UDP. Uh, ICMP will be reflected in white. Uh, and what we use this for is just watching if something lights up like this, or it gets wider. The size of the dot also or, represents the size of the packet. So, right, so the amount of data that we're seeing. So if we're seeing a, somebody trying to DOS something or, uh, or somebody just super abusing the bandwidth, uh, then it Scanning will... Scanning the network. Yeah, it will light up really um, significantly. And so we know like, hey, we should maybe take a look at what they're doing. Or when we see scans, what it actually looks like is a starburst, right? Because it's hitting a bunch of different hosts, and so one host is just 
And so we just say, hey, look, there's somebody looking for something to do. It's quick visual feedback, obviously, whether or not we need to dig in more. Well, I should also say, so the format of this is we're going to try to run through these slides relatively quickly. Um, and then we, we try to give, most people give five to ten minutes for questions. We try to do like half the time, and we'll, we'll get that answer for you. So these are some other dashboards that Ruckus provides. Basically, this is a spectrum analysis between the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. Uh, again, you can not necessarily, it's not necessarily anything that's going to tell us, oh, somebody's hacking somebody else or, or anything to that extent. It's, uh, it's quick visual information that we can glance at as far as the dashboard goes and then look in further if we need to, if there's any issues and obviously dig in with our other tools um, and, and forensics and get to there. But speaking of Wi-Fi. Good. Here's basically all the, the quick stats that we got from uh, Ruckus and things that we saw. So basically, again, we had... Uh, yes, set it over there, please. Um, I'm drinking. My bad. 1,100 um, 1, plus unique devices. Again, all of this depends. You guys jump on the Wi-Fi, whether it's laptops in the trainings, uh, phones, tablets on the general Wi-Fi. Uh, everything is on the... Uh, 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 wireless at that point. We don't have wired connections here in these shows. Busiest device hit about 50 gigs, which is kind of small in some extent. Um, busiest room, it's always SID, advanced infrastructure hacking. Uh, they were doing some fun stuff, and we can dig in. You can see other clients, the amounts on each SSID, et cetera, and basically the information that we saw there. So a uh, healthy amount of stats. I wouldn't say that anything abnormal that we saw. More iOS than Android more Windows than Mac, and a whole bunch of Linux mixed in. All right, so these are, um, these are our DNS stats. So uh, again, Cisco with Umbrella, we're getting uh, all kinds of good DNS data. What we see, and I know it's hard because this projector's bulb is going out, but um, it's 7 million DNS requests um, for 2018. So that's up from 5.6 in 2017. So um, more traffic, more going on there. And what we see up here is the stuff that we essentially allowed, right? Those are things that we would go, ah, like in a normal environment, you probably wouldn't care uh, to allow that. But once again, this is black hat, so hashtag YOLO sec. Um, <laughs> and then. And we haven't really we mentioned nothing. that, but we, we block nothing outbound of, of this network because of the types of traffic that you're going to see flowing from labs and everything that happens in trainings, et cetera. If we were to block normal malware or, malware or potentially harmful traffic that everybody else would see in a normal environment and block, we don't because we'd ruin a training or we'd ruin someone's lab down at Arsenal or whatever the case may be at that point. We, we allow it to go unless otherwise needed. Yeah. And I mean, sometimes we do have to do that. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, I actually, I like this GIF. I'm going to talk about the GIF. Uh, I like it because it's like, oh, it's going to evolve, and then it doesn't. <laughs> like, so it's like, it makes it like, you're like, come on. Like, you know, there's no payoff. It just, yeah, like, a, you are magic card, just a floppy Yeah, dish. it just pissed me off. <laughs> like, so I put it in there. Um, so, yeah, so that says ever-changing goals. Um, so when we initially start or started doing the network, the thing that we really wanted to do was just get it stable. So when um, uh, Jeff Moss, who at the time was the owner of Black Hat, called me up, I had volunteered at, at a single Black Hat show prior to that. And he said, uh, hey, we liked you. We want you to come and run the network. You know, you can bring a team of people or whatever. Um, I brought two guys, which was a mistake. Um, it was, there were three it's of too us many running people. the entire network. Way yeah. too many people. Um, <laughs> but the big thing was like trying to keep the network up. And that first year at the U.S. show, I had a 15-minute outage over the entire length of the show, which I guess is pretty good for a conference. And then especially that conference, that 15-minute uh, outage was one of the trainers uh, showing off a zero day in his class. And when I happened to check on the class at one point, he was like, hey, did the network go down? And I was like... I hate you and your mom. Um, <laughs> so, um, so stability is huge. We want to make sure you guys can actually use it. Um, from a security standpoint, uh, our crown jewels to us is the registration system, right? We don't want your information getting out there. If somebody pops reg and now all of the private information of you know, the foremost information security people in the world is now out there. Um, I guess, you know, Black Hat has to close its doors, right? So, um, 
It's a bit of pie on our face. So, so you know, that, that's important to us. Um, then we started rolling into things like segmentation. You know, initially the network was flat, which um, was funny um, <laughs> in the early years of Black Hat. Uh, and, and it was definitely... Um, Only the strongest classes survived. Yeah, <laughs> that was, that's true. It was like, are you brave enough and strong enough to survive the Black Hat Network? Um, but at a certain point, some of the classes were like genuinely like, okay, here's this thing that we did. Let's try that out on the class next door. Um, and so we're like, damn it. You know, like, okay, so we, you know, we split up every training class now, so everybody gets their own. Uh, and then we do host isolation as well. Um, we try to keep you guys from, from messing with each other. Uh, but again, if you do and you're successful, for the most part, we'll, we'll let it go. <laughs> we'll be like, ha, 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 ha. Look, there it goes. Um, so then we were, we were interested in, in what was actually taking place on the network. What were the things that maybe we were missing that we wanted to get eyes on? We're like, what's, what's actually happening? How can we get more intelligence into this environment? And so that's where we um, started to look for a way to do threat hunting in the environment, and that's where we brought in NetWitness. So um, we write all of the packets that traverse the network to disk. So um, I know that's a oh, gasp, right? It's not big brothery at all. Um, it, the reason that we do that is so that if we see an anomaly, we see something that looks like um, we should actually care, the bad bad, um, then we can roll back the clock and say, well, what has that person done over the last 24 hours, or what have they done over the last three days. So um, that data is all wiped at the end of the show. Um, it is a wipe, um, not just a delete. So, um, so yeah, we, we don't keep that. Um, we are, uh, like our privacy as well. Again, we're not trying to watch what you guys are doing. Um, it's just more about finding people who are coming after us um, and then taking care of that. Then um, the malware sandboxing part, that's where Cisco comes in. So we, um, we had some in interesting information about malware that was being passed over the wire, but we weren't sandboxing it and seeing what it would do. Now we can do that. We see something interesting. We can pull the file out of the stream with NetWitness, throw it into ThreatGrid, detonate it, and actually interact with it in like a glove box environment where we can click on things and you know, if the malware wants us to like, tell it something, we can, we can actually do that, which is really nice. And we've seen some, some cool malware strains uh, because we have that ability. Uh, the endpoint side was something where we were like, okay, clearly you guys aren't gonna install anything we give you. Uh, <laughs> that's a, hey, are you on the Black Hat Network? Install this executable. Um, wouldn't go over well, but we do control the machines that we get um, for registration. So those are rented by a third party, and we didn't like that it was some, who knows what happened to those machines prior. So we provide um, a golden image with the endpoint agents and stuff on it. They put that onto those laptops, which now we can monitor from the NOC. So we see anything that's happening on that device that's not just registration, we kill it. Um, there's a couple question marks there. I'll get into what that next piece was. Um, and then we're also gonna talk about, we wanted to do some automation. What's ways that we could uh, take care of some tasks that we wanted to do, but just didn't have the bandwidth to do. So I'll talk about that. So here's those question marks. If you stop by the knock, you could see this guy, uh, one of our uh, tier three analysts. Um, <laughs> Taking a look at, he's at drinking, what's, he's, he's just waiting, right? He's waiting. And the reason he's waiting is because um, starting at the U.S. show this year, we decided um, to put some honeypots out onto the network to see whether or not something was taking place um, that we needed to be concerned about. Um, more of a canary, I guess, really, than, uh, than a honeypot. But that canary um, lets us know in a, in a very specific way. Um, <laughs> that somebody has, has poked the bear. So uh, Cookie That's Monster, the escalation. Yeah. So <laughs> Cookie Monster loses his freaking mind, and we know, OK, somebody's touched something that they, should, they shouldn't even be in that part of the network. When it comes to automation, uh, again, there are things that we wanted to do. We'd see clear text account credentials coming across the wire, so things, you know, FTP or email accounts. Um, IMAP or, or POP3 stuff, and we were like, it would be nice to be able to like inform people, 
that this was taking place, but we just don't have the bandwidth to do that. We have in the past, briefly, walking into classrooms yeah. and saying, hey, it was an incredibly somebody's being dumb. Process. But it was, it was a very manual and, and obviously dilapidated process for what we're trying to do, and again, the evolution of where we've come. So, so we didn't have, uh, w with the amount of stuff that we were seeing, uh, going in and trying to find someone, especially through, it's easier to do in the trainings because we know where that individual is. They're in this room, right? So we can go into the room and say, hey, so and so, you know, can we talk to whoever? And then they, we talk to you in the back, and then we're like, "Oh man, you're passing your stuff," or "You're totally owned." Um, and so, then they didn't believe us, and we tell them their yeah. password, and they're like, "Okay." Yeah, they're like, "No, no, I'm fine, I'm fine." And it's like, you know, your your password is "I love kitties." Um, so, um, and then you have uh, confirm malware, so stuff where we saw it, but again, we don't know who the user is, or we see crypto mining traffic. Um, these are the notifications that now we're sending um, using RSA's got uh, an orchestration piece that we um, have started to use that allows us to send uh, essentially a pop-up, like a, a captive portal that says, hey, I see your stuff, right? So in this case, this is what it looks like on a mobile device. This is what it would look like on, you know, on a PC or laptop, whatever. You're, um, and it's just saying, at this point, it said email, which we're like, oh, because we were going to email it. And then we decided to do it captive portal, so we edited that later in the week. Um, but yeah, and then they have to basically click through. It just says, it's, this is informational. If you're aware that there's crypto mining going on on your machine, then carry on. Like, that's the best use of your you know, employer's resources I can think of. Um, and so they just say, OK, great. But then they can reach out to us and say, can you give us more data? We pull you know, packet captures and screenshots and stuff and then send it back in an email and say, here's, here's what we were looking at. So the automation and basically collaboration of all that. So, so NetWitness gives us that information when we see that. So if we see clear text passwords or we see the crypto mining or we see um, the malware C2 traffic that we can confirm, this is where the automation and basically collaboration between those partners comes in and what we've been building for show after show after show that is finally getting to the point that uh, it's, it's very useful. It's, it's basically getting to the point that we want. But again, that, that is continually evolving and not necessarily end state by any means. So at this point, basically, NetWitness provides that information. They've seen that. And we uh, send that information over to Palo Alto, who then adds that user machine into a dynamic user group. That dynamic user group is then put into a policy that provides that captive portal. You will see that, again, click through provides a cookie so that you don't keep seeing that. You can clear that if you need, but again, that's why you may or may not see it. Uh, and then basically, we're, we're trying to automate these things to give you guys the information that you need, keep you safe, because again, and I'm sure you know as, as security practitioners, we can do so much on our side, but if you're not aware of what's happening or even aware that you're owned or, or mining cryptocurrency for somebody else in an, some random country, then we're trying to provide you that information because, again, any other day, we're on the other side of the fence just like you. So uh, we're, we're just as curious about those types of things as well. We actually didn't say that. We didn't say what our day job are, right? So I'm a full-time threat hunter for RSA. Uh, he works for Palo Alto. It didn't go down the way you think it did. <laughs> right? It's the other way. Like, we started working with these teams in the knock, and they were like, we want to hang out with you all year long because you guys are so cool, and we'll give you money to hang out with you. And so now we work there. So that's how cool we are. See us after and bring your wallets. <laughs> so, so again, this is, this is going to be ever evolving. The, the samples that we can get from NetWitness on those packet captures are then forwarded over to Threat Grid and everything's detonated that way so we can see those samples, see the bad bad versus the good bad. And any other information here that basically we can use, we are actively trying to automate as much as possible to add more security and stability to both the environment as well as just informative to to the users so again huge deal and, and we appreciate all the partners and the teams that, that do this and it's it's becoming a, a very well oiled machine at this point but we'll we'll keep chugging and there's certainly more to keep going on that front though. yeah it really is like it's a team effort like collaborating on not only just what we what our expectations are for the knock which is all these teams delivering information and um, it, it's it's been great to watch the relationships between those teams develop as well so um, you know they're like oh your product doesn't interface with our product in this way but that would be useful and then like by the time like a, you know another black hat show rolls around they're like hey we 
you know, added that feature. So now we work better with your gear. Um, so to see things like that happen is pretty cool. But that collaboration all goes, also goes just as, again, we're all security practitioners, right? So, um, so we had an interesting issue where there was a trainer who was, um, they were just like, I can't VPN to anything. Um, actually, the, the initial statement was, the black hat knock is blanking me. Um, <laughs> and so the they thought we were, um, we, we were blocking VPN you know, access or whatever outside of the network, which wasn't the case. Um, and what ended up, I mean, we, were, we worked through like troubleshooting as a team, we're like, okay, well, what, what is happening there? Because if we were plugged in, it worked. If we were... Um, well, if, the VPN would establish you could ping, there's DNS resolution, but oh, large web pages wouldn't load. So it was one of the most frustrating, annoying things. But to the, the collaboration of those teams, long story short, consumer-grade VPNs, if you were on UDP, uh, and if anybody's seen this, like private internet access or anything like that, and you couldn't load a web page while you had your VPN established, change it to TCP. So there were some things that we added that basically there's more overhead from the tunneling to the APs back. So the overhead of the tunneling there, the overhead of your... Uh, VPN and then your normal packets, basically large packets were not being fragmented across UDP. So if you saw that problem and you change your VPN to TCP and you can then fragment, you'll be good. But to that point of collaboration, everybody in the NOC was working together to work on this. It had nothing to necessarily do with a configuration issue on any of our sides, if that's the case, but it was a problem that we needed to at least dig down into and solve. Um, we went, the, we went full tech support mode. Full blown. Full tech support. Like, yeah, it was ridiculous. Like, I actually went to the trainer's classroom and, like, showed him how to configure <laughs> things so that I was like, okay, you got to get this config file from here, and we're going to do it, like, full tech support. That's the level of service we provide here at Black Hat. <laughs> um, so, I guess, um, I guess we should start out with a... Yeah, it's a bravo for sure. So you're going to see oh, some... Black. Yeah, kind of build you guys. Please, please. Like seriously, in past shows, um, we w what we s would see was one in three emails was in the clear. This is here. This is the U.S. Um, Asia figured it out a little while ago. Ninety percent of their traffic is encrypted. Um, but this show. But that was Huawei doing it for us. <laughs> yeah, no. Sorry, um, but. Uh, <laughs> You can see Black Hat USA, 30% um, insecure protocols. But what we saw this show was actually only 14 unique users were sending their account credentials for email across the wire in the clear. Again, because of the automation piece, we let those 14 know. So here's hoping for 100% next year. Um, but but so nice. called arms. Damn, yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> we, like we, every show, when we talk about this stuff, when we do this like debrief, <laughs> Um, we're like, we'd love to see everything encrypted, and we're, we're almost there, at least for on the email side. GDPR for the win. So this is the interesting thing, because like last year, what did we say? It was mid-50s, the 60%, I want to say, was encrypted. 55% encrypted last year. So if we can legislate accepting cookies, and that means that that much traffic is encrypted, whether it's through GDPR or whatever else we need to, if you guys are really just launching VPNs, which... I don't know with what we just talked about if that was necessarily the case. But if that's what it takes, we as security practitioners in this room and this, con this conference need to be the ones that are protecting ourselves before we can go back to our socks or knocks and work and, and protect our environment there. So we are very, this brought a tear to our eyes to see. We, I literally can't tell you that we were sitting in that chair and didn't believe the stats yeah. that he was giving us. I was literally like, I'm like, is this correct? Are you sure this is right? If, yes. This but is. to that point, again, if that's what it takes, then maybe that's what we should do. But again, a call to arms to you guys as well. Let's, the closer to 100 we get, we'll be happy. And again, we're not man in the middle of anything, so we wouldn't see it, but that's not our job. We're not here to intercept your traffic and look at the funny videos, although we'd love to get those. That is not the point. So if you encrypt everything, bravo. Thank you. We don't want to see it. Let it go. Um, so this one was uh, was interesting. So again, so we are trying to 
protect the network from attack or pr protect you guys from attack. In this particular case, we had to protect the outside internet from an attack. <laughs> so, from us. <laughs> um, yeah, from inside Black Hat. And what was happening was there was a training class going on, and I don't know if it was just somebody learned to do something new or whatever, and they got excited and were like, let me fire this off at the internet. Um, but somebody was like actively trying to do SQL injections outside of the Black Hat network, right? So I had to go into a classroom, and I was like, hi, I'm Grifter knock it off like you know <laughs> um but yeah so um so when we see this happen again there's our, our level three, three analyst tells <laughs> us what room it's in tells so the automation of seeing that yeah so that, that legitimately is part of the automation this is a you know a, a map of the conference space and then cookie monster shows up in whatever room is having the particular issue so he's down here cookie uh, marks the spot out. yeah cookie marks the spot and then um, but yeah so we went in so sometimes we're here to, to protect us, and sometimes we're here to protect you guys from yourselves. Outbound web shell. So this is an interesting one that basically we saw a web shell. So so quick story, and again, trying to tie in collaboration. Um, Palo Alto saw some stuff that basically provided they walked over and talked to the RSA guys to dig into NetWitness a bit. Uh, basically, we saw somebody that had a web shell to a WordPress site that could have been a lab at... <laughs> may not have been, <laughs> you know, that's, that's to each their own, but uh, basically there was a web shell that there was interactions, there was 600-ish commands connecting and receiving back and forth to that web shell, and this was out on the open internet. So again, whether somebody learned something or that's been a while and they just needed to get the updated stats from their back door, then that could have been that as well. So, interesting things. All right, I, you're going to... This is super frustrating, and you're going to hear me get a little upset here for a minute. So big fix or big broken. So this is not the first time that we have seen this. Um, and again, this is something where we as security practitioners need to be diligent, and this is why we show it not to call out a company, although that's about to happen. <laughs> big fix, if you all know what that is, an IBM product that basically they provide endpoint monitoring for uh, asset management, right? Well, they phone home to their servers and they provide the information for that asset management. Well, apparently within BigFix, there is an option to do that unencrypted. So there's no recon that has to happen because if you just start watching the network, you can see every version of every software, every piece of software on that machine and have your full recon done on that machine. So the problem is that it's an option to do that. So if you have big fix, go back and double check, first of all. And I will say, I won't throw on the company under the bus that this was, but this was a security company who is using big fix and their, person, their, their laptops, their corporate machines are phoning home and providing every piece of information in the clear on those security companies' laptops. This shouldn't be an option, but again, to the extent that we'll call out IBM and Big Fix, we also will call out you as security practitioners that don't just believe what you see or don't assume when you're sending back all of the information from your corporate machines that it's encrypted. Trust is one thing, and we talk about trust a lot in the types of, of protocols and other things that we do, whether SSL, TLS, certificates, etc. Do not trust another company to protect you. You're there to protect your company. Double check it, take a PCAP, look at some things, and make sure that you're not sending every piece of information that a hacker would ever want about those machines. So, yeah, hopefully they're listening, because uh, this should not even be an option. It should not be a feature to send things unencrypted over the interwebs. I checked, it doesn't say FireEye in there anywhere. Ah! Um, <laughs> ah. All right, so move on. Right? Um, this, these are. So from angry to like, this is our. <laughs> yeah. Man, you guys are ridiculous. So the end of the, man, there's a lot of adult content on this <laughs> network. Um, it's super weird every show. Like, we don't, like, I'm, I, I don't know why I'm just, I, I'm always surprised by the amount of it. Um, but. Um, I don't know why we're surprised. Anymore. Yeah, so there is there is a direct um, correlation between the time of day and when the most adult activity happens, and that is lunch. <laughs> um, 
I, cool, I guess. Um, you do you. I guess, they're, technically, that's true. They're doing exactly that. Um, and, then, and then also toward the end of the day. So about 4.30, it's like, oh, I don't want to pay for whatever the hotel's offering. I better <laughs> download some stuff um, for my extracurriculars later. <laughs> All right. We give you even the tops. These man, yeah. Man. So these butts showed another appearance this year, but it fell off the list. It did fall yeah. off the list. It did. That was really popular in the U.S. <laughs> it was. Um, so the the longest um, porn streaming session, seventeen point six seven minutes. Um, <laughs> that they, you know, that's okay. Keep cool. trying. Great. Um, <laughs> I, you what, can't what even don't it, hit what the was it at the, What was it at the U.S. show? It was like 50 minutes. We yeah. started. We it had was a, was a We long... gave a round of applause. What was it? What was it? 121 That's minutes. Right. Two hours. Two hours. <laughs> Get up that know. slide. Um, and then the shortest. <laughs> 18 seconds. Wife chat. It wasn't just well, we wife didn't, chat. What we didn't have at the U.S. show was the, the sites that they went to. We didn't put that up there. But then, like, it was, I think it was 11 seconds was the shortest session in the U.S. show. And I was like, what's that link? Because <laughs> am- it must be amazing. Um, so we, we figured we'd share. Um, so, yes. Keep it weird, Blackhead. So we, keep yeah, it we, weird. We like to keep it weird. Wait, wait, wait. You didn't... What? Oh. All right. So... <laughs> So what is, we had to run the numbers and crunch it a bit. So this is the longest, that's the shortest. But overall, all of the adult sessions that took place um, over the course of Black Hat, we have the MTTO, anybody? Mean, mean time, time to, to orgasm, right? So, um, so yes, yeah, so that is 42 seconds. <laughs> Solid work. Um, so we will leave you on that, um, that light note and just... Start asking us questions. What do you got? There's got to be questions after that, though. Let's start going. Go ahead. Uh, recently, mobile devices like started uh, randomizing MAC addresses whenever they connect. Mm-hmm. What do you think, or how, do, how does that impact your st- stats? Uh, I mean, as stats go, and I, it, as far as stats go, that certainly will, if you're randomizing a Mac every time, that we will see it as a unique device if you're connecting and reconnecting over and over and over. So, I mean, as far as that goes, it may be skewed, but it, we're not doing it just by Mac. Uh, where did NS go? I saw him up here. All right. Just by Mac? We're not doing just Mac. And you can tell us devices. It's, huh? Mac and host name. Mac and host name. So, and that, that may skew. I might, yes. I might throw the numbers off, but... Um, but mostly just on the unique devices. So, um, yeah, good. Questions? Next, next. I can't be the only one in here. No way. Oh, there you go, right there. Did the honeypot pick up anything? Did the honey- no. Yeah. So a few things, and that's an interesting piece that that. Which I mean, honestly, I don't dare people. We're not pushing anything, <laughs> but. It's but it's cool. Leave it alone. <laughs> like, don't go look. We did not at this show. So um, there was yeah. only a few hits in, in the U.S. show. And that's, again, some evolution. We won't dig into too far what we're trying to do and kind of where that goes. Obviously, that gives away some of the surprise. Um, but no, there were no hits here. And I'm okay. We're curious, we're curious if other people are curious and not digging in, if that's the case, or if you're just being professional because you're a black guy and your company paid. But again, we're certainly okay with that. That's our job is to provide stable, secure network. That's the case. Then so be it. Over here. Over there. Uh, so, obviously, you do a lot of stuff internally on the network. Um, do you do sort of any monitoring of things coming from external um, to internal that wasn't kind of triggered by anything internally? So, we actually. Well, I won't dig in too far. We we do not allow basically anything in. Palo will view obviously is the the that WAN gateway that they're seeing anything. There are logs, and we have information around that. Uh, for the most part, everything seems like standard. Just something hanging out on the internet. That you're just getting scanned and banged up that way. Pal obviously does a great job of securing that, and making sure that there's no issues. But there's certainly we we don't we don't allow anything that's not an established session. So. Couple. Two, yeah. Have you gotten any 
legal action from an over excited person from Black Hat. Well, so expand on that when you say legal action from. I mean, if 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 there was some SQL inje injection done on some external website, have it gone? Oh, uh, yeah. Further? So, uh, so is there any legal action? Or um, I think some people will also ask that question and have the police ever gotten involved or those type of things. Like so, no, no legal action outside of what normally like law enforcement would take care of. We have had in the past that not at this show, but at other Black Hat shows. Um, the U.S. in particular, um, and uh, people from the show were doing things outside of our network on right. hotel networks, et cetera, that certainly police were involved, but obviously that has or to Or in some cases, you know, people were planning a, attacks or screwing around and trolling folks that were in the casino area, but planning those things out in the clear um, on the Black Hat network over IRC and that kind of thing, where we let the security team know that, that you know, hey, somebody's heading over to the Luxor to mess with your stuff, um, because we have those relationships with them. The closest we ever got to, um, so we, we have, like, you know, the, like, it's like, well, we can call, uh, we have a relationship with the FBI, so we can say, hey, like, there's an issue. Um, the closest we ever got was this year at the U.S. Like we legitimately thought somebody was like physically in danger, um, and in the end, like we were like after after a bunch of investigation, um, it wasn't the case, and the guy probably would have deserved it anyway. So. <laughs> somebody there else up here, right? You're raising your hand. Sorry, my question was um, kind of already answered, but I was going to ask. What Let's do it again then. Right. What's the most uh, interesting bit of incident response you've had to do with Black Hat? Man, most interesting. Uh, as far know. as incident, I wouldn't say that we really do incident response outside of. Beca it, again, because incident response would be deemed something completely different outside of this environment. So as far as that goes, the most interesting stuff is walking into a room and saying, "Y'all are being dumb. Stop it." Yeah. Um, or, or it's the like you know, it's the. The tier one analyst type crap where you're right. like, you ICC two coming from your machine like this. So it's not, it's not that interesting because we don't see full scale attacks like on this network. There's no, like it's not like oh the Black Hat network's under attack from APTs or what. Like it's, it's yeah. What we what we do try to do is because the users um, do come infected or they are you know, transmitting stuff in the clear. It's just more about hoping that they, we can provide feedback enough to where they leave Black Hat actually more secure than when they came um, versus what most people think about the Black Hat network, which is like, oh, got to get a burner laptop and a burner phone and I got to, like, you know, cut all ties with my family. Um, <laughs> like that, that kind of stuff. Um, we're actually trying to make it, like, the, the opposite experience. Kind of change that stigma, if you will, and be yeah. willing to use it. Anybody else? Right here. Um, what, what is meeting? You, you, you show an amazing setup, right, of different products. What would you add if you could, like, even if it's not, like, existent? So, so showing the partners you're saying? Like, if if we could add any product to the Black Hat network, even if it doesn't exist, yeah, what would it be? Oh, snap. V oh, VC right here, like kind of thought. <laughs> come trying to come up with a good that? idea for the next. So, so I mean, as far as I know your game. So, as far as that goes, I, I would say that there's a few things that we're trying to get that we've played with some other things, and we've added the way that we work with partners, I guess, to that extent that. At the U.S. show, for example, Eka How, if you've ever heard of Eka How, brought their uh, wireless spectrum analysis that they have some of the really cool tools to do that and basically help do uh, RF scanning, et cetera, to, to verify that our airspace is, is clean, if you will, so that we don't run any issues that way. So there's some, some things that way that we've worked with other tools. I think as far as our core infrastructure and the main stuff that we have, we're... I feel like we're pretty set right now, and again, we're getting kind of set in that stride and, and feel comfortable with where we're at, but there's always different tools that, that we'd love to use that may give us more insight, more information, and play with, but I can't really say that there's anything specific that we're looking for, but if there's something out there and somebody wants to, you know, see what it would look like there, we're certainly open to talk. Um, like Eka How worked with... Like, absolutely. Yeah, like we, and we have brought stuff in that we then have decided, oh, it's 
not what we thought it would be. We've but. tried some different things around wireless, doing some uh, triangulation for other things, but that didn't seem to be as big of an issue. So that, again, it's more around tools and just visualization and what can make our job easier, if you will. Um, some automation platforms, again, with the evolution of things that we're getting to. But uh, again, for the most part, I wouldn't say that there's anything that we're necessarily searching for yet, but, but we're always open to, to looking at different things that may open our eyes a bit more. All right. Well, we don't want to keep you guys from your last, last session. Oh, quick, oh, quick. Go ahead. Go. What products are you using for your seam and orchestration? So the, that is the NetWitness platform. What so platforms what, are we using for SIM and orchestration? Are you like an RSA plant or something? He's like, what are you using for your, you know, your SIM and your orchestration? It's, it's the NetWitness platform. And then um, like where the RSA guy's over here, you can pay this guy when you're done. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's what, that's what we're using. Thanks so much, guys.